nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is the light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleepers, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you. We pray that your will be done, your kingdom come. Lord, we are so thankful that the name of Jesus, that the powers of darkness tremble, Lord. Help us to be the light to this world. Open our hearts and minds as we read your word today and just have your spirit impress upon us not only the words but the way that we should behave, Father, and the love that you have for each and every one of us and everyone on this world, Father, and that we are called to be those ambassadors of Christ to bring that message of reconciliation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning's sermon is entitled a hero character analysis okay do you know what a character analysis is well i'll give you a definition first so that you're sure of that it's when you evaluate a character's traits their role in a story and the conflicts that they experience when analyzing you want to think critically you want to ask questions and draw conclusions about the character by looking at the three areas that we mentioned their traits their role in the story and the conflicts that they experience so we need to define traits also. Character traits are all the aspects of a person's behavior and attitudes that make up that person's personality. Everyone has character traits, both good and bad. Character traits are often described with these type of adjectives, patient, unfaithful, or jealous. That's the dictionary's definition. But if we go here again, we discover that heroes are most commonly identified with because of their faith. That's what Hebrews chapter 11 said over and over and over again. And if we read from Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 39, it says, These were all commended for their faith. So we've had 38 verses of telling you about all these heroes and heroines of faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us that only... Together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, because we are su surrounded by these witnesses who didn't even experience Jesus Christ, which we have, let us throw off everything, not some of it, not part of it, but everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. It entangles us easily. It traps us. The devil is waiting like a lion seeking to whom he may devour and destroy. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is our perfect hero. He is the perfect, perfect example of faith. But many times we do have human characters that we either imitate or don't imitate. And what we should be looking for is what their faith is, that defining character. And the Word of God tells us to imitate those so that we can see living examples of those who imitate Christ. Jesus is our one true hero, but there are many heroes and heroines, and we talked about that before. And as we mature in our faith, we also have a responsibility to be that hero figure, to teach our children, to train them up, to mentor them. <clears throat> because we are all ambassadors of Christ. And if we don't train them up, then guess who's going to be training them? The world. Those heroes that the world says are heroes. So that's why we're going to look at a character analysis today of a particular hero. Why is faith the divining characteristic of a hero? Why isn't it our works? Why isn't it some other reason? Because we are righteous because of our faith. 
By faith, Noah was righteous. By faith, Abraham was righteous. Faith is what makes a difference because we're all sinners saved by grace. There's nothing we can do because there are none righteous, no, not one. So we need to examine that characteristic in our life because the world needs heroes and heroines. This world is hurting. This world is dark. And we need to be the light of that world. Faith is the one thing that will separate us, that will make a difference, our faith in Jesus Christ. The faith that leads to hope, that leads to love. These three things remain, and it starts with faith. Faith in Jesus Christ is what leads to righteousness, and it is the defining characteristic of a hero or heroine. Paul wrote a little bit more about it in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation. Because there is salvation no other way except through God's perfect plan and through Jesus Christ. To everyone who chooses to believe. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed through His Word. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Righteousness comes by faith, and the righteous will live by faith. We skip to Romans chapter 3, verse 22. It says, This righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Paul is clear what brings about our righteousness. He's telling this to a world who has not experienced it before. The Jews were God's chosen people, but Jesus Christ came and He invited the world to believe through Him that all men might be saved. If we keep on reading in Romans chapter 4, verse 13, it says, It was not through the law, because that's what people were accustomed, that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that they would be heir of the world but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law only brings wrath, and, there, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace, the same grace that we read about in Romans 3.24, and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, the same Abraham that we read about in Hebrews. Not only those who are of the law, but also to those who have faith in Abraham. He is the father of us all. Faith is what defined Abraham, what made him righteous in the sight of the Lord. Going back to the passage in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. We don't have to see to believe in God. We don't have to fully understand. We just have to have faith. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous. When God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith Abel still speaks, even though he is dead, by faith Enoch was taken from this life, so that he did not experience death. He could not be found, because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone comes to him must believe that he exists, that he is the creator of all the world, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You can say you believe in your head, but does that mean your heart believes? And if your heart believes, as James said, shouldn't there be an outward sign? Shouldn't your life be changed? If we have faith, it should be evident because we should have hope and we should have love. It is through our faith that we are saved. Our faith in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. Faith is that, divine, is that divine characteristic that changes our lives and makes us into those kind of heroes that imitate Christ. Noah, by the time Noah came about, and we're going to read a little bit more about him in a minute, there had been 
Ten generations, ten or eleven, I think it's ten, since Adam. And the world was wicked. There were about 10, 000, ten million people in the world. And everyone was wicked except one man. One man filling the gap. He is a representative of Jesus Christ, but Noah can't save everyone, can he? But by his faith, he was counted as righteous. And God said, I will not destroy this earth. He said, build an ark and I will save you and your family. And Noah did. And he saved his children. But we'll see in a little bit that it didn't last long before we turned back to our wicked ways. Because see, we're fighting a spiritual battle, as Paul says. As Jesus says, we have two masters. We have to just decide which master we're going to follow. So in verse 7, it said, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear... Fear is the beginning of wisdom. He built an ark. Why? To save his family because he not only knew who God was, but he knew that all protection, all good things came from God. And by his faith, he condemned the world, one against ten million, and became an heir of righteousness. We see it over and over again. That is in keeping with faith. If we read on... In Romans chapter 4, we read about Abraham. If we read on here in verse 8, it says, By faith, Abraham. And that's where we'll close out this part of the story. By faith. That's what the difference in all of these heroes. So I want to examine a couple heroes today. And I want you to remember that faith is their divining characteristic, correct? So we need to determine whose faith that they believe in. They're normal human beings. They're flawed. They're filled with doubts and insecurities, just like you and I, aren't they? But we have a master that we serve. We have a faith that we believe in or a faith that we deny. They experience comfort and pain and they react to these things based on their faith, just like the analysis said. So let me ask you a question. Do you have faith that leads to righteousness? If you don't, then you need to get right with God. Plain and simple. And that faith should lead to hope. It will lead to hope. It will lead to love. So that you are able to love even your enemies, as Jesus said. Because you'll realize that that's exactly what God did when He loved you and He gave His Son for you. You were an enemy. You sinned against a righteous and holy God. And God's Word says that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And it says, for the wages of sin is death. And God doesn't want that because He loves each and every one. Everyone that's in here in these walls and everyone that's outside. It is His will that they come to Him. Not only come to Him, but that He adopts them as their own son or daughter. So do you really have faith that leads to righteousness? Romans 1.17 said the righteous will live by faith. And Hebrews 11.6 said without faith it is impossible to please God. So it's a very important thing for you to consider. If you keep reading... In Hebrews 11, 6, it says, Because anyone comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. God demands it. That's my word. King James' word uses diligently. But what does that mean, those who diligently seek Him? It means to carefully seek out, to scrutinize, to beg, and to crave for. If you're not craving for more knowledge about God, then you need to get your heart right. David was a man who was after God's own heart. We saw that he was a sinner over and over, but his heart was focused on God. He knew who God was and he loved God despite his sin and shame. And God forgave him. And he's in this list that he's counted righteous because of his faith. Not because of his deeds or anything else, but because of his faith. So the first character that I want to look at today, and probably the only character today, is a character named Nimrod. We'll probably have to do another character the other day. What does Nimrod mean to you? I just saw Polly go, hmm. What does the Nimrod mean? Nimrod is a Green Day album. Nimrod is a warplane. Nimrod is a X-Men character. We're talking about superheroes. That's kind of ironic that that Nimrod is a superhero, so to speak of. Who was that Nimrod? In 1985, he was an X-Men character that was created. He was a powerful, virtually indestructible descendant of a robotic mutant hunt hunting sentinels. Whew! He's a superhero. 
and he is derived from the Nimrod found in the Bible in Genesis 10, 8, and 9, where it says Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And we'll examine that a little bit more in the Bible, in a minute. So who was this Nimrod from the Bible? Well, he was Noah's great-grandson. Remember that the world had been utterly destroyed because of its wickedness except for one righteous man. Because of him, him and his family were saved. His sons and his son's wives went into the ark. There was, that world was destroyed. It only took four generations this time for the world to become totally wicked. And it didn't start with Nimrod. It started with Noah's son, Nimrod's grandfather, Ham. We have got to be the heroes and heroines that our children need to see. We need to teach them to fear their God and that their God loves them just as much, and that we can tell them now that we have seen what these valiant heroes and heroines of Hebrews did not see. We can see that God's plan became fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and that death was defeated at the cross. Wow. What we have so much more than these heroes and heroines of old. So let's look at the Nimrod. Nimrod, like I said, was, was Noah's great-grandson. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 1, it says, This is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. In Genesis 10, verse 6, it says, The sons of Ham are Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Ramah, and Saptica. I probably butchered them, but oh well. The sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan, Cush was the father of Nimrod. First, that we're introduced to this character. He became a mighty warrior on earth. That means he was a superhero. He was a mighty man. He might not have been a Marvel comic, because I don't think Marvel comics were around then. But he was a superhero of his day. He either conquered cities or he made cities. But was he a hero that we should recognize? The Bible doesn't have that much to say about him. And you can't just take that scripture. Because what does that mean? He was a mighty warrior on the earth. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You have to take God's word and you have to study it. He's only mentioned four times in the Bible. Nimrod was a hero to the world. You better believe he was. In fact, he was a god. He was bigger than Lash LaRue. He was bigger than Green Lantern. He was the biggest guy in his day. And what he said is, I'm not going to worship the God of my father, Noah, the God of Adam. I am going to be my own God. I am going to make my own destiny. You know, I told you last week about what was the biggest movie at the box office. Well, this weekend it got knocked off by a Disney movie. Thank goodness. That was good. But it's really ironic that last weekend, it was still the number one movie. And you know what the number two movie was? I'm not making this up either. And I didn't plan this sermon based on that. It was the gods of Egypt. <laughs> Is that not crazy? So the Marvel superhero beat out the ancient gods of Egypt. They're still, we're dealing with gods and goddesses and heroes. And how are their character traits, if we do an analysis? Are they someone that we should honor as a hero or somebody we should say, no, this is not the kind of hero that I'm going to follow. Genesis 10, chapter 10 through 12 says, the first centers of his kingdom, okay, we don't have his name, but we're talking about Nimrod here, were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, Kelna, and Shinar. From, the land, from that land he went to Assyria, where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kala, and Rezin which is between Nineveh and Cala, which is a great city. We read about him one other time in 1 Chronicles 1.10. It says, Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on earth. So we see he's a mighty warrior again. But again, is that good or bad? Well, let's analyze this here. If his first kingdoms were Babylon, was that known in the Bible as a good place? What about Nineveh? Isn't that where Jonah refused to go because they were so wicked he did not even want to see them turn to the Lord? But the Lord said, I want anyone who will turn to me to turn to me. You're a sinner just the same, Jonah. 
And I want all men to believe in me if they will and escape the punishment that they have of eternal separation from me. I love them. I'm going to send my son to them so that I can adopt them as my very own. He was a dominant man of his time. He conquered a lot of great cities. He built a lot of great cities. He was a superhero of the world in his day. But his defining characteristic was not faith in Yahweh. It was not faith in Jehovah God. It was faith in man. It was faith in himself. Last week I mentioned some of the mottos. The motto of Spider-Man, for example, the world, the, says with great power comes great responsibility. Where our new hero takes that same motto and says with great power comes great merchandising opportunity. And he's being literal and letting you know it. I don't mind at all what I say or do as long as it makes me money. That would have been Nimrod's philosophy in that day. He was a mighty warrior. He was a hunter of men. He destroyed and conquered men. And he opposed God. He was probably the one, if we read on, that is responsible for the Tower of Babel. And one of the things that he probably said, and the reason I say probably is I am referring this. This is not straight out of God's Word. But he probably said, I don't care about the God of Noah. I am not going to honor Him. I am going to build a tower up to heaven because I am mighty. If you decide you're going to flood this earth again, we're going to escape it through our might and through our power. We're going to rise above it. That's probably what Nimrod said. And the world was watching him and the world was following him. And the world was becoming more and more wicked. So let's analyze this character. He was a great hunter, a mighty warrior, but he was a hunter of men. He conquered and built cities and kingdoms. And he didn't do like Noah when Noah came out of the ark. He didn't build an altar to God. You won't find that in Scripture. His name means rebel or rebellion. So if you put that together with the great warrior, the mighty hunter, you understand a little bit more about it. If you look at the name up in the dictionary, you'll get a skillful hunter or an inept person. But recently, in the last 50, 60 years, I don't know how long, sometimes Nimrod has come to another meaning. It's mean a buffoon or an idiot. And I don't know exactly where that started. If you Google it, you'll find out that Bugs Bunny started it. When he told Elmer Fudd he was a Nimrod. But that's not the case. You can't believe everything you find on the internet. Can you believe that? I have searched, I spent a day searching all my Looney Tunes files and online and everything else. And the only time I found that Bugs Bunny used Nimrod is he called Yosemite Sam one when he let him go into the furnace. I don't know what that was an implication of. And Yosemite Sam was having a party in there. And Bugs Bunny said, I can't do that to the little Nimrod. That was in the 1950s, mid-50s. But if you go back to 1948, you will find who was even a bigger person of sarcasm, Daffy Duck. He did call Elmer Fudd a little Nimrod. Watch and you'll see. How am I ever going to catch that screwy duck? Precisely what I was wondering, my little Nimrod. Now, you got to wonder, Looney Tunes were loony, but they sure were sarcastic, weren't they? What did the writers mean here? I don't think they were looking great upon the character of Nimrod. I think they were poking fun. Maybe they were reading your Bible. If you look on the backs, you'll see where a little boy calls, of your bulletins, you'll see where a little boy calls his sister a Nimrod. And his dad said, well, at least we know he's been reading your Bible. Again, I don't think that's what happened. I don't think it was meant. And if it was, then let's examine what, who Nimrod was. As Bugs Bunny does say over and over again, he calls Elmer Fudd a maroon. So I'd like to throw that out there too. Maybe... Nimrod was a maroon because he did not fear God Almighty and he chose not to worship Him. <clears throat> I don't know what Warner Brothers meant by any means, but I know when I do study the Word of God that it gives me light, that the Holy Spirit talks to me and reveals God's Word. So it discerns the difference in between what people might think are heroes and what aren't heroes. It gives me a guideline, a foundation to go by. 
And if these other men and women were great characters of faith, that was because of their faith in God, their faith in Jesus Christ. And Nimrod was not that type of person. Genesis 10, 9 says, He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. It's repeated twice. It's not a compliment. It's saying that the world was turning to wickedness again instead of following after God. God that had only four generations before spared mankind because He loved them so much. Because only one person had faith. And that's such a comforting thought to know that if there was only one person that God would still be faithful. That He still loves even I or even you or whoever that is. Because He wants all to come to Him. To get a better understanding of that verse though, I'd like to quote the International Standard Version. It says, He became a fearless hunter in defiance of the Lord. That is why it is said, like Nimrod, a fearless hunter in defiance of the Lord. Because that's what he was doing. And we need to recognize that in our societies today. And so many times we choose the worst of two evils. But we need to stand firm in our faith and not choose any kind of evil. Because the light's purpose is to expose darkness. That's what our purpose is as the light of the world. Gill's exposition, exposition commentary says this, He was called a mighty hunter because he was all his days taking provinces by force, spoiling others of their substance, and that he was before the Lord truly, seeing and taking notice of it open and publicly and without fear of God in bold and impudent manner in despite of God. The Septuagint renders it against the Lord. He intended to provoke God to His face. And the world said, this is fine. We'll worship you. And if you look back in history, you'll see Him recognized under the names of Gilgamesh, or you'll see Him recognized under the name of Orion, or other gods, even the god Marduk. Nimrod said, world... Let's tell God we don't need Him and we're not going to worship Him. And see, if you're deceived, you won't realize that you worship one God or not or the other. Jesus said you can't have two masters. He didn't say anything about three or four. He said you can't have two. It's either God or those who oppose God by the prince and ruler of this world, the devil. You are fighting a spiritual battle whether you want to realize it or not. Genesis 11.4 says... Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to heaven. It doesn't say Nimrod anymore. It says, Let us. Because the world and the heroes of the world were following this God, this heroes. Let us defy God, so that we may make a name for ourselves, not for God. There's no glory in this. There's no faith in God. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the earth. This is our hero of that day, Nimrod, who just four generations before, God had saved his great-grandfather. His great-grandfather came out of the ark and built an altar to God, not questioning him or anything else, but thanking him for his grace, his love, and his mercy. So what is his role in the story? And when I say the story, because that's the second part of the characteristic analysis, we're talking about God's story, not mankind's story. The Bible, was he that righteous man of faith? Well, the Bible says that he came from a cursed nation. That's a telltale sign to begin with. The world was becoming more and more wicked. And he was their hero. He was the one that conquered and led and opposed God. The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 106, verses 34 through 38. They did not destroy the people as the Lord had commanded them. But instead, they mingled with nations and adopted their customs. This is what's grown out of Nimrod. They worshipped their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to false gods, literally. But we sacrifice our sons and daughters to other idols as well if we don't teach them the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What faith brings if we don't teach them to stand firm. If we just say, well, it's too hard to be a parent, so I choose to let them go and let the world do it for you. It's a bad formula if you do that, and it will lead to destruction. 
goes on to say, They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. That's Nimrod. That's the nation that he came out of, his descendants. And the land was desecrated by their blood. I said it before, but light has no association with darkness except to expose the darkness. That is so that they can come to the light, so that they can be saved, even if there's only one of them, because God loves each and every one. In our scripture from this morning in Ephesians 5, verses 10 through 17, it says, it starts out this way, and find out what pleases the Lord. So you need to examine what doesn't and then find out what does. Have nothing to do, not some, but nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed to the light will become visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then, so he says it again, whether it's redundant or repetitive or not. Be careful then how you live, not unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. And you have opportunities every single day. If you don't think you do, pray about them. Have God reveal them to you because they're every single day. Because the days are evil, the time is drawing near. Therefore, do not be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is. We've been talking about that several times. And to find out what the Lord's will is, guess what? You have to lay down your own will first, don't you? You have to put it at the feet of the cross. You have to say, Jesus, I will follow you. You have to believe in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. But you have to also say when Jesus says, if any of you want to be my disciples and come after me, then deny yourselves, take up your cross, it's not easy, and follow me. That's what it takes. So what were the conflicts that this man faced? The same conflicts that you and I face. Good versus evil, right versus wrong, God versus the devil, a spiritual battle. And he faced who he was going to serve. He was serving himself, not the devil, right? Well, if he was serving himself, he was not serving God, so he was serving the devil. If you're not serving God, you better look at who your master is. And you look at Nimrod as that example and what happened to the world in such a short period of time. BibleTools.org says this. Remember, this is not the Bible. This is BibleTools.org. So some of it may be true, some of it may not. But this is what it says about Nimrod, just to give you a little more light on the subject. Two key figures in the origin of Christmas are Nimrod, a great-grandson of Noah, and his mother and wife, Semiramis, also known as Ishtar and Isis. Nimrod, known in Egypt as Osiris, was the founder of the first world empire at Babel, later known as Babylon. From ancient sources such as the Epic of Gilgamesh and records unearthed by archaeologists from long-ruined Mesopotamia and Egyptian cities, we reconstruct subsequent events. After Nimrod's death, Samaria, Samirimus promoted the belief that he was a god. A few years later, Samarius bore a son, Horus or Gilgamesh. She declared that she had been visited by the spirit of Nimrod, who had left her pregnant with, this, with the boy. Is this sounding at all distorted but vaguely familiar? She declared that she had been visited by the spirit of Nimrod, who left her pregnant with the boy. Horus, she maintained, was Nimrod reincarnated with the father with a father, mother, and son def def defied, a deceptive, perverted trinity was f formed. During the time between Babel and Christ, pagans developed the belief that days grow shorter in winter because their sun god was leaving them. When they saw the length of the day increasing, they, they celebrated by righteous and unrestrained feasting and orgies. This celebration, known as a Saturnalia, was, called, was named after Saturn, another name for Nimrod. It is a chief custom of the corrupt system denounced all through the Bible, prophecies and teachings under the name of Babylon. It started and originated in the original Babylon of the ancient Nimrod. Nimrod, grandson of Ham, son of Noah, was the real founder of the Babylonians, Babylonian system that has gripped the world ever since. The system of organized competition of man-ruled governments and empires based upon the competitive and profit-making economic system. 
Nimrod built the Tower of Babel, the original Babylon, ancient Nineveh, and many other cities. He organized the first world's first kingdom. The name Nimrod in Hebrew is derived from Marad, meaning he rebelled. This man who started the great organized world apostasy from God that has dominated the world ever since. Paul said it simply this way, we fight a spiritual battle. And he tells you to put on the full armor of God, not part of it, because we are facing a battle. And you have to decide who you are going to serve. You can't serve both God and money. And money means everything that we want instead of God. Everything that the devil puts up there and gives us false hope in. Because we're building our lives if we're doing that on shifting sands and they will fall out from under our feet. So I hope this helps in analyzing a character. But we have to take that thought and ponder it. We have to say, where is our faith? We've exposed this character as one who doesn't have faith in God. But where is our faith in God? Where are our heroes' faith when it stands into faith with God? And what are we going to do about it? James said, to show, me your work by, show me your faith by your works. He also said that faith without works is dead. Now, it's not a contingency upon salvation, but if you have faith again, it will lead to hope. Hope that Satan cannot give you. He will tell you you'll have hope if you'll have riches, if you have power. Solomon said it was all meaningless. Not only did he say it was meaningless, but meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Repeated it so it would get through our thick heads. If you're chasing after any hope that is not from God, it's false hope. You'll never have the joy and you will never know what the love of God means. You'll never be able to share it with others. So I challenge you today to not only look at your heroes, but look at your life and where your faith stands and who your faith stands in. Let's pray. Father, I thank You so much for Your Word. I thank You that the Bible is full of great examples. Examples of men and women who are flawed in every way, just like us, Lord. And You choose to love everyone. All that You ask is that they turn, they repent from their evil ways and turn to You. Accept who You are and what You did for them through Jesus Christ. And Father, then You have t said through Jesus that they are born again. That they're not the same. They're a different creature. And you've empowered them by your Spirit to take on this spiritual battle that we face. Father, if we do try to face it on our own, we may do good at times, but we'll never have the success that we need. Help us to take our will and throw it aside and take on your will. Help us to lay our burdens upon Jesus. Let Him carry them for us. And help us to be the light to the world that so desperately needs you. We long and yearn for the days when Christ will return and that you'll set all things perfect by your glorious will in, heaven, in the heavens and the earth. We thank you for you are worthy and so is the Lamb. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.